Chapter 60 John Are you well, Snow? Lord Mormont asked, scowling. Well! His raven squawked. Well! I am, my lord. John lied, loudly, as if that could make it true. And you? Mormont frowned. A dead man tried to kill me. How well could I be? He scratched under his chin. His shaggy gray beard had been singed in the fire, and he'd hacked it off. The pale stubble of his new whiskers made him look old, disreputable, and grumpy. You do not look well. How's your hand? Healing. John flexed his bandaged fingers to show him. He had burned himself more badly than he knew throwing the flaming drapes, and his right hand was swathed in silk halfway to the elbow. At the time, he'd felt nothing. The agony had come after. His cracked red skin oozed fluid, and fearsome blood blisters rose between his fingers, big as roaches. The maester says I'll have scars, but otherwise the hand should be as good as it was before. A scarred hand is nothing. On the wall you'll be wearing gloves as often as not. As you say, my lord. It was not the thought of scars that troubled John. It was the rest of it. Maester Eamon had given him milk of the poppy, yet even so, the pain had been hideous. At first it had felt as if his hand was still aflame, burning day and night. Only plunging it into basins of snow and shaved ice gave any relief at all. John thanked the gods that no one but ghosts saw him writhing on his bed, whimpering from the pain. And when at last he did sleep, he dreamt, and that was even worse. In the dream, the corpse that he fought had blue eyes, black hands, and his father's face. But he dared not tell Mormont that. Dywin and Hake returned last night, the old bear said. They found no sign of your uncle, no more than the others did. I know. John had dragged himself to the common hall to sup with his friends, and the failure of the ranger's search had been all the men had, ta had been talking of. You know, Mormont grumbled, how is it that everyone knows everything around here? He did not seem to expect an answer. It would seem that there were only two of... of those creatures, whatever they were. I will not call them men. And thank the gods for that any more, and... Well, that doesn't bear thinking of. There will be more, though. I can feel it in these old bones of mine. And Maester Eamon agrees. The cold winds are rising. Summer is at an end. And a winter is coming such as this world has never seen. Winter is coming. The stark words had never sounded so grim or ominous to John as they did now. My lord... He asked hesitantly. It said there was a bird last night. There was? What of it? I had hoped for some word of my father. Father! taunted the old raven, bobbing its head as it walked across Mormont's shoulders. Father! The Lord Commander reached up to pinch its beak shut, but the raven hopped up on his head, fluttered its wings, and flew across the chamber to light above a window. Grief and noise, Mormont grumbled. That's all they're good for, ravens. Why I put up with that pestilential bird? If that was news of Lord Eddard, don't you think I would have sent for you? Bastard or no, you'll steal his blood. The message concerned Sir Barristan Selmy. It seems he's been removed from the King's Guard. They gave his place to that black dog Clegane, and now Selmy's wanted for treason. The fool sent some watchmen to seize him, but he slew two of them and escaped. Mormont snorted, leaving no doubt of his view of men who'd sent gold cloaks against a knight as renowned as Barristan the Bold. We have white shadows in the woods, an unquiet dead stalking our halls, and a boy sits the Iron Throne, he said in disgust. The raven laughed shrilly. Boy! 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 Sir Barristan had been the old bear's best hope, John remembered. If he had fallen, what chance was there that Mormont's letter would be heeded? He curled his hand into a fist. Pain shot through his burned fingers. What of my sisters? The message made no mention of Lord Eddard or the girls. He gave an irritated shrug. Perhaps they never got my letter. Eamon sent two copies with his best birds, but who can say? More like Pycelle did not deign to reply. It would not be the first time, nor the last. I fear we count for less than nothing in King's Landing. They tell us what they want us to know, and that's little enough. 
and you tell me what you want me to know, and that's less, John thought resentfully. His brother Rob had called the banners and ridden south to war. Yet no word of that had been breathed to him, save by Samuel Tarley, who'd read the letter to Maester Eamon and whispered its contents to John that night in secret, all the time saying how he shouldn't. Doubtless they thought his brother's war was none of his concern. It troubled him more than he could say. Rob was marching and he was not. No matter how often John told himself that his place was here now, with his new brothers on the wall, he still felt craven. Corn! the raven was crying. Corn! Corn! Oh, be quiet, the old bear told it. Snow, how soon does Maester Eamon say you'll have the use of that hand back? Soon, John replied. Good. On the table between them, Lord Mormont laid a large sword in a black metal scabbard banded with silver. Here, you'll be ready for this, then. The raven flapped down and landed on the table, strutting toward the sword, his head cocked curiously. John hesitated. He had no inkling what this meant. My lord? The fire melted the silver off the pommel and burned the cross guard and grip. Well, dry leather and old wood, what could you expect? The blade, now, you'd need a hot fire a hundred times as hot to harm the blade. Mormont sho shoved the scabbard across the rough oak planks. I had the rest made anew. Take it. Take it, echoed his raven, preening. Take it! Take it! Awkwardly, John took the sword in hand. His left hand. His bandaged right was still too raw and clumsy. Carefully, he pulled it from its scabbard and raised it level with his eyes. The pommel was a hunk of pale stone weighted with lead to balance the long blade. It had been carved into the likeness of a snarling wolf's head, with chips of garnet set into the eyes. The grip was virgin leather, soft and black, as yet unstained by sweat or blood. The blade itself was a good half-foot longer than those John was used to, tapered to thrust as well as slash, with three fullers deeply incised in the metal. Where ice was a true two-handed greatsword, this was a hand and a halfer, sometimes named a bastard sword. Yet the wolf sword actually seemed lighter than the blades he had wielded before. When John turned it sideways, he could see the ripples in the dark steel where the metal had been folded back on itself again and again. This is Valyrian steel, my lord, he said wonderingly. His father had let him handle ice often enough. He knew the look, the feel. It is, the old bear told him. It was my father's sword and his father's before him. The Mormonts have carried it for five centuries. I wielded it in my day and passed it on to my son when I took the black. He is giving me his son's sword. John could scarcely believe it. The blade was exquisitely balanced. The edges glimmered faintly as they kissed the light. Your son... My son brought dishonor to House Mormont, but at least he had the grace to leave the sword behind when he fled. My sister returned it to my keeping, but the very sight of it reminded me of Jorah's shame, so I put it aside and thought no more of it until we found it in the ashes of my bedchamber. The original pommel was a bear's head, silver, yet so worn its features were all but indistinguishable. For you, I thought a white wolf more apt. One of our builders is a fair stone carver. When John had been Bran's age, he had dreamed of doing great deeds, as boys always did. The details of his feats changed with every dreaming, but quite often he imagined saving his father's life. Afterward, Lord Eddard would declare that John had proved himself a true Stark and place ice in his hand. Even then he had known it was only a child's folly. No bastard could ever hope to wield a father's sword. Even the memory shamed him. What kind of man stole his own brother's birthright? I have no right to this, he thought. No more than to ice. He twitched his burned fingers, feeling a throb of pain deep under the skin. My lord, you honor me, but... Spare me your butts, boy, Lord Mormon interrupted. I would not be sitting here were it not for you and that beast of yours. You fought bravely, and more to the point, you thought quickly. Fire, yes, damn it. We ought to have known. We ought to have remembered. The long night has come before. Oh, eight thousand years is a good while, to be sure. Yet if the night's watch does not remember, who will? Who will? chimed the talkative raven. Who will? Truly the gods had heard John's prayer that night. 
The fire had caught in the dead man's clothing and consumed him as if his flesh were candle wax and his bones old dry wood. John had only to close his eyes to see the thing staggering across the solar, crashing against the furniture and flailing at the flames. It was the face that haunted him the most. Surrounded by a nimbus of fire, hair blazing like straw, the dead flesh melting away and sloughing off its skull to reveal the gleam of bone underneath. Whatever demonic force moved Othor had been driven out by the flames. The twisted thing they had found in the ashes had been no more than cooked meat and charred bone. Yet in his nightmare he faced it again. And this time the burning corpse wore Lord Eddard's features. It was his father's skin that burst and blackened, his father's eyes that ran liquid down his cheeks like jelly tears. John did not understand why that should be, or what it might mean, but it frightened him more than he could say. A sword small payment for a life, Mormont concluded. Take it! I'll hear no more of it, is that understood? Yes, my lord. The soft leather gave beneath John's fingers, as if the sword were molding itself to his grip already. He knew he should be honored, and he was, and yet, he is not my father. The thought leapt unbidden to John's mind. Lord Eddard Stark is my father. I will not forget him, no matter how many swords they give me. Yet he could scarcely tell Lord Mormont that it was another man's sword he dreamt of. I want no courtesies either, Mormont said. So thank me no thanks. Honor the steel with deeds, not words. John nodded. Does it have a name, my lord? It did once. Longclaw, it was called. Claw! The raven cried. Claw! Longclaw is an apt name. John tried a practice cut. He was clumsy and uncomfortable with his left hand. Yet even so, the steel seemed to flow through the air, as if it had a will of its own. Wolves have claws as much as bears. The old bear seemed pleased by that. I suppose they do. You'll want to wear that over the shoulder, I imagine. It's too long for the hip, at least until you've put on a few inches. And you'll need to work your two-handed strikes as well. Sir Andrew can show you some moves when your burns have healed. Sir Andrew? John did not know the name. Sir Andrew Tarth, a good man. He's on his way from the Shadow Tower to assume the duties of Master at Arms. Sir Alistair Thorne left yestermorn for East Watch by the Sea. John lowered the sword. Why? He said stupidly. Mormont snorted. Because I sent him, why do you think? He's bringing the hand your ghost tore off the end of Jaffer Flower's wrist. I've commanded him to take ship to King's Landing and lay it before this boy king. That should get young Joffrey's attention, I'd think. And Sir Alistair's a knight, high-born, anointed, with old friends at court. Altogether harder to ignore than a glorified crow. Crow! John thought the raven sounded faintly indignant. As well, the Lord Commander continued, ignoring the bird's protest. It puts a thousand leagues twixt him and you without it seeming a rebuke. He jabbed a finger up at John's face. And don't think this means I approve of that nonsense in the common hall. Valor makes up for a fair amount of folly, but you're not a boy anymore, however many years you've seen. That's a man's sword you have there, and it will take a man to wield her. I'll expect you to act the part henceforth. Yes, my lord. John slid the sword back into the silver-handed scabbard. If not the blade he would have chosen, it was nonetheless a noble gift, and freeing him from Alistair Thorne's malignance was nobler still. The old bear scratched at his chin. I had forgotten how much a new beard itches, he said. Well, no help for that. Is that hand of yours healed enough to resume your duties? Yes, my lord. Good. The night will be cold. I want hot spice wine. Find me a flagon of red, not too sour, and don't skimp on the spices. And tell Hob that if he sends me boiled mutton again, I'm like to boil him. That last hunch was gray. Even the bird wouldn't touch it. He stroked the raven's head with his thumb, and the bird made a contented, quirking sound. Away with you. I've work to do. The guards smiled at him from their niches as he wound his way down the turret stair, carrying the sword in his good hand. Sweet steel, one man said. Yeah, and that snow, another told him. John made himself smile back at them, but his heart was not in it. He knew he should be pleased, yet he did not feel it. His hand ached, and the taste of anger was in his mouth, though he could not have said who he was angry with or why. 
A half dozen of his friends were lurking outside when they le- when he left the King's Tower, where Lord Commander Mormont now made his residence. They'd hung a target on the granary doors, so they could seem to be honing their skills as archers, but he knew lurkers when he saw them. No sooner did he emerge than Pip called out, "'Well, come about. Let's have a look.' "'At what?' John said. Toad sidled close. "'You rosy butt cheeks. What else?' "'The sword,' Gren stated. "'We want to look at the sword.' John raked them with an accusing look. "'You knew,' Pip grinned. "'We're not all as dumb as Gren.' "'You are so,' insisted Gren. "'You're dumber.' Halder gave an apologetic shrug. "'I helped Pate carve the stone for the pommel,' the builder said. "'And your friend Sam bought the garnets in Molestown.' "'We knew even before that, though.' Gren said. Roger's been helping Donald Noy in the forge. He was there when the old bear brought him the burnt blade. The sword, Matt insisted. The others took up the chant. The sword, the sword, the sword. John unsheathed the long claw and showed it to them, turning it this way and that so they could admire it. The bastard blade glittered in the pale sunlight, dark and deadly. Valyrian steel, he declared solemnly trying to sound as pleased and proud as he ought to have felt. I heard of a man who had a razor made of Valyrian steel, declared Toad. He cut his head off trying to shave. Pip grinned. The Night's Watch is thousands of years old, he said, but I'll wager Lord Snow's the first brother ever honored for burning down the Lord Commander's tower. The others laughed, and even John had to smile. The fire he'd started had not, in truth, burned down that formidable stone tower, but it had done a fair job of gutting the interior of the top two floors, where the old bear had his chambers. No one seemed to mind that very much, since it had also destroyed Othor's murderous corpse. The other white, the one-handed thing that had once been a ranger named Jaffer Flowers, had also been destroyed, cut near to pieces by a dozen swords but not before it had slain Sir Jeremy Riker and four other men. Sir Jeremy had finished the job of hacking its head off, yet it died all the same when the headless corpse pulled his own dagger from its sheath and buried it in his bowels. Strength and courage did not avail much against foemen who would not fall because they were already dead. Even arms and armor offered small protection. That grim thought soured John's fragile mood. I need to see Hob about the old bear's supper, he announced brusquely, sliding Longclaw back into its scabbard. His friends meant well, but they did not understand. It was not their fault, truly. They had not had to face Othor. They had not seen the pale glow of those dead blue eyes, had not felt the cold of those dead black fingers. Nor did they know of the fighting in the Riverlands. How could they hope to comprehend? He turned away from them abruptly and strode off, sullen. Pip called after him, but John paid him no mind. They had moved him back to his old cell and tumbled down Hardin's tower after the fire, and it was there he returned. Ghost was curled up asleep beside the door, but he lifted his head at the sound of John's boots. The direwolf's red eyes were darker than garnets and wiser than men. John knelt, scratching his ear, and showed him the pommel of the sword. Look, it's you. Ghost sniffed at the carved stone likeness and tried a lick. John smiled. You're the one that deserves an honor, he told the wolf. And suddenly he found himself remembering how he'd found him, that day in the late summer snow. They had been riding off with the other pups, but John had heard a noise and turned back, and there he was, white fur almost invisible against the drifts. He was all alone, he thought, apart from the others in the litter. He was different, so they drove him out. John, he looked up. Samuel Tarley stood rocking nervously on his heels. His cheeks were red, and he was wrapped in a heavy fur cloak that made him look ready for hibernation. Sam, John stood. What is it? Do you want to see the sword? If the others had known, no doubt Sam did, too. The fat boy shook his head. I was heir to my father's blade once, he said mournfully. Heartsbane. Lord Randall let me hold it a few times, but it always scared me. It was Valyrian steel. Beautiful, but so sharp I was afraid I'd hurt one of my sisters. Dickon will have it now. He wiped sweaty hands on his cloak. I, uh, 
Maester Aemon wants to see you. It was not time for his bandages to be changed. John frowned suspiciously. Why? he demanded. Sam looked miserable. That was answer enough. You told him, didn't you? John said angrily. You told him what you told me. I... he... John, I didn't want to. He asked. I mean, I, I think he knew. He sees things no one else sees. He's blind, John pointed out forcefully, disgusted. I can find the way myself. He left Sam standing there, open-mouthed and quivering. He found Maester Aemon up in the rookery, feeding the ravens. Clytus was with him, carrying a bucket of chopped meat as they shuffled from cage to cage. Sam said you wanted me? The maester nodded. I did indeed. Clytus, give John the bucket. Perhaps he will be kind enough to assist me. The hunched, pink-eyed brother handed John the bucket and scurried down the ladder. Toss the meat into the cages, Eamon instructed him. The birds will do the rest. John shifted the bucket to his right hand and thrust his left down into the bloody bits. The ravens began to scream noisily and fly at the bars, beating at the metal with night-black wings. The meat had been chopped into pieces no larger than a finger joint. He filled his fist and tossed the raw red morsels into the cage, and the squawking and squabbling grew hotter. Feathers flew as two of the larger birds fought over a choice piece. Quickly, John grabbed a second handful and threw it in after the first. Lord Mormont's raven likes fruit and corn. He is a rare bird, the maester said. Most ravens will eat grain, but they prefer flesh. It makes them strong, and I fear they relish the taste of blood. In that, they are like men. And like men, not all ravens are alike. John had nothing to say to that. He threw meat, wondering why he'd been summoned. No doubt the old man would tell him in his own good time. Maester Eamon was not a man to be hurried. Doves and pigeons can also be trained to carry messages, the maester went on. Though the raven is a stronger flyer, larger, bolder, far more clever, better able to defend itself against hawks. Yet ravens are black, and they eat the dead, so some godly men abhor them. Baylor the Blessed tried to replace all the ravens with doves, did you know? The maester turned his white eyes on John, smiling. The Night's Watch prefers ravens. John's fingers were in the bucket, blood up to the wrist. Dywin says the wildlings call us crows, he said uncertainly. The crow is the raven's poor cousin. They are both beggars in black, hated and misunderstood. John wished he understood what they were talking about and why. What did he care about ravens and doves? If the old man had something to say to him, why couldn't he just say it? John, did you ever wonder why the men of the Night's Watch take no wives and father no children? Maester Eamon asked. John shrugged. No. He scattered more meat. The fingers of his left hand were slimy with blood, and his right throbbed from the weight of the bucket. So they will not love, the old man answered. For love is the bane of honor, the death of duty. That did not sound right to John, yet he said nothing. The maester was a hundred years old, and a high officer of the night's watch. It was not his place to contradict him. The old man seemed to sense his doubts. Tell me, John. If the day should ever come when your lord father must needs choose between honor on the one hand and those he loves on the other, what would he do? John hesitated. He wanted to say that Lord Eddard would never dishonor himself, not even for love. Yet inside a small, sly voice whispered, He fathered a bastard. Where was the honor in that? And your mother? What of his duty to her? He will not even say her name. He would do whatever was right, he said, ringingly, to make up for his hesitation, no matter what. Then Lord Eddard is a man in ten thousand. Most of us are not so strong. What is honor compared to a woman's love? What is duty against the feel of a newborn son in your arms, or the memory of a brother's smile? Wind and words, wind and words. 
We are only human, and the gods have fashioned us for love. That is our great glory and our great tragedy. The men who formed the Night's Watch knew that the only their courage shielded the realm from the darkness to the north. They knew they must have no divided loyalties to weaken their resolve. So they vowed that they would have no wives nor children. Yet brothers they had, and sisters, mothers who gave them birth, fathers who gave them names. They came from a hundred quarrelsome kingdoms, and they knew times may change, but men do not. So they pledged as well that the Night's Watch would take no part in the battles of the realm it guarded. They kept their pledge. When Aegon slew Black Heron and claimed his kingdom, Heron's mother was Lord Commander on the Wall, with ten thousand swords to hand. He did not march. In the days when the Seven Kingdoms were Seven Kingdoms, not a generation passed, the three or four of them were not at war. The watch took no part. When the Andals crossed the narrow sea and swept away the kingdoms of the first men, the sons of the fallen kings held true to their vows and remained at their posts. So it has always been, for years beyond counting, such is the price of honour. A craven can be as brave as any man when there is nothing to fear, and we all do our duty when there is no cost to it. How easy it seems then to walk the path of honour. Yet soon or late in every man's life comes a day when it is not easy, a day when he must choose. Some of the ravens were still eating. Long, stringy bits of meat dangling from their beaks. The rest seemed to be watching him. John could feel the weight of all those tiny black eyes. And this is my day? Is that what you're saying? Maester Eamon turned his head and looked at him with those dead white eyes. It was as if he were seeing right into his heart. John felt naked and exposed. He took the bucket in both hands and flung the rest of the slops through the bars. Strings of meat and blood flew everywhere, scattering the ravens. They took to the air, shrieking wildly. The quicker birds snatched morsels on the wing and gulped them down greedily. John let the empty bucket clang to the floor. The old man laid a withered, spotted hand on his shoulder. It hurts, boy, he said softly. Oh, yes, choosing. It has always hurt, and always will. I know. You don't know, John said bitterly. No one knows. Even if I am his bastard, he's still my father. Maester Eamon sighed. Have you heard nothing I've told you, John? Do you think you are the first? He shook his ancient head, a gesture weary beyond words. Three times the gods saw fit to test my vows. Once when I was a boy once in the fullness of my manhood, and once when I had grown old. By then my strength was fled, my eyes grown dim, yet that last choice was as cruel as the first. My ravens would bring the news from the south, words darker than their wings, the ruin of my house, the death of my kin, disgrace and desolation. What could I have done, old, blind, frail? I was helpless as a suckling babe, yet still it grieved me to sit forgotten as they cut down my brother's poor grandson and his son and even the little children. John was shocked to see the shine of tears in the old man's eyes. Who are you? He asked quietly, almost in dread. A toothless smile quivered on the ancient lips. Only a maester of the citadel, bound in service to Castle Black and the Night's Watch. In my order, we put aside our house names when we take our vows and don the collar. 
The old man touched the maester's chain that hung loosely around his thin, fleshless neck. My father was Makar, the first of his name, and my brother Aegon reigned after him in my stead. My grandfather named me for Prince Aemon the Dragon Knight, who was his uncle, or his father, depending on which tale you believe. Aemon, he called me. Aemon. Targaryen? John could scarcely believe it. Once, the old man said. Once. So you see, John, I do know. And not knowing, I will not tell you stay or go. You must make that choice yourself and live with it all the rest of your days, as I have. His voice fell to a whisper. As I have.